Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for today's program on Exomism event, The Evolving Nature of Material Support. My name is Rosa Cabuz, and I'm a research fellow here at the program on Extremism. And I'm pleased to introduce Jeff Reinfeldt, who will be moderating today's event. Jeff recently retired from a long and distinguished career at DOJ, where he was a key player in the government's response to 9-11. And today he's a research fellow, senior research fellow here at the program. Jeff, whenever you want, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Rosa. And good morning and welcome to this very timely event. Uh, the evolving nature of material support prosecutions. Um, over the next 90 minutes, we are going to discuss uh, material support prosecutions over the last quarter century. Uh, my name is Jeff Breinholt. Uh, this topic is, is near and dear to my heart because I teach a course uh, as an adjunct at GW, George Washington University, on the topic of prosecuting terrorists in Article Three courts. And the secret or the thing that it, I think is very telling is the only statute that I teach in this course is material support. It's basically a one, one statute course where we discuss uh, 2339A and 2339B jurisprudence over the last 25 years. We have today uh, a panel that is distinguished by any measure. Uh, we have Mike Mullaney, who was uh, originally a Miami uh, assistant U.S. attorney doing terrorism. He actually, before that, he was a undercover uh, IRS agent in Miami. And he eventually uh, joined the U.S. attorney's office. And in the aftermath of 9-11, he was brought up to Washington to be the deputy chief of the counterterrorism section. And this would have been, what, 2003, 2002, 2003? 2003. Yeah. So we're going to hear from Mike, who really had a, a, a strong role in um, sort of revamping the counterterrorism section to focus on intelligence. And I hopefully hopefully he'll have an opportunity to, to give you some uh, 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 ideas of how challenging that was. We have Zainab Ahmed from uh, the Eastern District of, of uh, New York. Uh, she was part of the um, National Security and Terrorism Unit in ED New York, and she also worked on the Mueller team uh, in the in the uh, late 2000s. And um, she is now a partner at Gibson Dunn and Crutcher in New York. Uh, she specializes in uh, she did specialize in extraterritorial cases, and we'll hear uh, about how material support uh, impacted those cases and to the extent we were using them because it's relevant to what we're seeing in Gaza right now. And finally, we have Steve Ward, who is uh, a person, uh, he's, a, he's in a long line of legendary trial attorneys who always uh, uh, stayed in DC. He was always part of Maine Justice. He cut his teeth uh, with me at the tax division where uh, no matter how hard we tried, we, we couldn't get away from domestic terrorists, which were tax protesters. And Steve won a um, John Marshall Award, which is the department's highest litigation award for his efforts at convicting a major tax protester in San Francisco by the name of Philip Marsh. And so when 9-11 hit, we, we in the counterterrorism section brought Steve in uh, because he was very comfortable with large document cases and he has tried a number of material support cases and including including some relating to ftos we don't see very often which include al shabaab so maybe we'll hear about that today as well i just want to spend a few minutes before turning it over to mike uh, um, to talk about the evolution specifically the timeline of key dates in material support um, we'd have to start with April 19th, 1996, which was the one year anniversary of the Oklahoma City attack. 
on the one year anniversary of the Oklahoma City attack, Congress passed um, the so-called Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996. And in that statute, the C Congress directed the Secretary of State to designate a series of subnational groups that were considered by terms of the statute, by the definitions in the statute, to be FTOs, foreign terrorist organizations. And State Department got busy. The, the section at the time was run by Jim Reynolds, and there was a legislative uh, AU, uh, uh, legislative uh, attorney in the counter -ter the terrorism section uh, whose name was Steve Weglian. And they, they together they got together and um, essentially created this statute, 2339B, which was a nonviolent white collar statute. It basically says anybody who knowingly provides material support or resources to a designated foreign terrorist organization uh, shall be guilty of a felony. Uh, and that, so that's really where the statute is. And it wasn't until October 7th, 1997, that the Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, designated for the first time uh, a group of foreign terrorist organizations. Uh, there were 29 groups. They were all foreign. There were none, no domestic. And um, since then, some have dropped off and some have been added, but there are 63 groups currently that are classified by the State Department as foreign terrorist organizations. Between uh, between the original date of the designation by Secretary Albright on October 7th, 1997, until 9-11, really, we had four years where we were sort of uh, poking around at charging people with 2339B, uh, mainly fundraisers in the United States for foreign terrorist organizations. But we immediately got bogged down in constitutional litigation, and we started negotiating with the uh, aggrieved defendants who we have we had charged uh, over definitions that they claim were lacking in the statute. And that uh, litigation ended up culminating in uh, 2010 with the f full and final ruling that 2339B and the FTO designation process uh, was constitutional in, a, in an opinion written by Justice Roberts with a fairly stinging dissent by Justice Breyer, who would have declared 2339B unconstitutional. Uh, I, I wonder whether he would have been in that same posture had he had his vote actually mattered. But uh, Elena Kagan argued the case, uh, and she had already been named, I think she had already been named to a associate justice, but she argued the case as the Solicitor General. And so 9-11 hit, and 9-11 quickly turned into a mass reform of how we do business in terrorism. One of the, the there, there were in the aftermath of 9/11, there was the USA Patriot Act on October 26, 2001, and in that Patriot Act provision, there were two. There are actually two provisions that uh, made it so that prosecutors could be ha could have their case decisions informed by the full panoply of U.S. intelligence. So we crossed the Rubicon with the Patriot Act, and we made it so prosecutor decisions are, are important enough and recognized as such that um, you, you, um, the, that you uh, should be informed by information that's on the classified side, particularly FISA. Um, and then... So 2003, the wall came down and prosecutors like us were, uh, I can tell you, were dancing in the hallways because we saw how many cases could result in 2339B prosecutions, which we were lacking for the previous four years. And 
that's really where we started um, focusing on uh, changing the counterterrorism section into a um, uh, an intel consumer shop, uh, which was unique among prosecutorial offices. So we recruited a bunch of prosecutors, both in the field and at headquarters, and, and maybe Steve Ward later can tell us about the difference, the divisions of responsibility between the field and headquarters. The last thing that happened was 2002, and that was when a young American Californian named John Walker Lind was arrested or taken taken um, uh, captive by the U.S. military. He was fighting with the Taliban in the aftermath of 9-11. So we charged him with providing material support, and we charged him in Virginia. And we got Judge Lee as the uh, judge on that case. And his lawyers, who are Walker Lynn's lawyers, who were from California, made an omnibus motion to dismiss, claiming that the term personnel in the definition of material support or resources does not include your own body. They claimed that it, personnel meant recruiting others. So it doesn't include your own body. Well, that was rejected by Judge Ellis. And so that gave us a long line. And, and I would say it, it, it the long line of uh, jihad cases from Lackawanna to Portland, Oregon, to other places, and a growth in jihad cases later when ISIS came onto the scene. And we assumed international obligations to prevent our nationals from traveling to Syria to fight. Let's start with Mike. Mike, how what were the challenges in turning around the, the terrorism section to include this revolutionary statute of material support or resources? Was that a, was that a challenge when you came on or how, and, and tell us how you came on uh, from Miami? Well, when when 9-11 occurred, um... I was an AUSA in Miami, um, and as an example of how unprepared U.S. attorneys in particular were, I mean, by 2003, really, for the most part, only New York really did terrorism cases. They had they had all the experience, and 9-11 happens, and Miami is thrown into it because 15 of the 19 hijackers had spent significant amounts of time in southern Florida, and then, of course, you had... Um, EDBA in DC with the Pentagon, um, New York already, and uh, Pennsylvania. So um, we were basically thrown into the fire. As I say, only New York really had terrorism experience. Um, and that's how I got into it. Um, despite the fact that we were the third largest US attorney's office in the country, we only had one AUSA who had any national security experience whatsoever. And uh, she worked in my section. so we basically became Miami's national security section at that point. Um, you know, I stayed involved um, tangentially. The first anthrax attack was three weeks later, um, which was also, you know, sort of wrapped into 9-11, at least initially while people were figuring things out. So um, I was the lead on that initially in South Florida. So that's basically, my introduction into terrorism were those two cases. Um, you know, I traveled to Iraq with the with the military um, after we uh, entered, invaded Iraq, um, and then came to the counterterrorism section in 2003. Um, I mean, as far as turning it around, I mean, you know, um, it was already underway by the time I got there. Um, Barry Sabin was now the chief, um, but it wasn't, wasn't so much turning it around in so far as learning, you know, the ins and outs of Intel, um, actually convincing the Intel agencies that prosecutors could be trusted with security clearances and getting the information and, um, and actually listening to the intelligence agencies when they said, well, you know, you can look at this, but you can't use it unless you come to us. Um, and oftentimes negotiating, not just in 2003, but for years thereafter, we would uh, 
sit down with intelligence agencies and negotiate over what information we felt we needed to prosecute, what information they felt was too sensitive to be used in prosecution, and come to an agreement as to how we would do it. And mm -hmm. of course, that involved FISA and involved uh, SEPA hearings, which quite honestly was something I'd never heard of until I got to DC. Okay. Um, so, and that's SEPA, Classified Information um, Procedures Act. Um, those are, those hearings are generally um, ex parte hearings in front of the court. And then, um, you know, oftentimes clear defense counsel are also allowed in. But it was, it was a process just learning how to deal with the intelligence agencies, but it was equally a process with the intelligence agencies and the military learning to deal with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, a, it's a, it was nothing if not a cultural chasm that everybody was trying to figure out. Zainab, you came on the scene in 2008, 2007, where the infrastructure that Mike is describing uh, had, already been in had already been in place for a couple of years. Can you tell us how, to the extent to which the, ma the material support statute uh, helped you in your subspecialty, which was extraterritorial terrorism cases? Sure. Um, I think it, material support, the statute itself was extremely significant in the in our ability to prosecute the types of extraterritorial terrorism cases that did not include actually completed acts of violence against mm -hmm. Americans or destruction of American property. Because for those crimes, there was already extraterritorial, extraterritorial jurisdiction. And we did charge a lot of crimes like that. I charged somebody with the murder of US soldiers in Iraq, another individual with the murder of a diplomat in Niger. And so when you had completed acts of violence, um, those were easier to bring into US federal court. But when you just had violent conspiracies and ones that were, had the potential to significantly harm American interests, even if not literal Americans, there was not extraterritorial jurisdiction. Were that to have happened in the US, there would of course be jurisdiction. And probably the material support statute domestically made some cases federal that would otherwise have been state. Um, but when you talk about uh, cases like uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, particularly in the time of Anwar al-Awlaki, was mm -hmm. very active and successful in fomenting acts of violence in the U.S. But they did that without reaching the U.S. They did that by publishing videos and incitements to violence and the like. And we had an individual in Nigeria who was recruited by them because he was fluent in English, taken to Yemen, trained um, both in how to publish the right videos online, help them with their newsletter, and in um, in artillery and weapons, and then sent back to Nigeria with cash to recruit more English speakers to both efforts. That's the sort of thing that clearly has the implication to um, negatively affect U.S. interests. And it's not something Nigeria was capable of prosecuting him for because he hadn't yet done anything in Nigeria and they had no extraterritorial jurisdiction. So that's a case where because we could charge him, with providing material support to Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and carrying a weapon in furtherance of that, adding a 924C count because material support is, of course, a crime of violence. We could hold somebody accountable and incapacitate somebody who otherwise probably would have gone on to do significant harm to, to citizens of all countries, but, but also U.S. interests. So I think that the key part of what material support, the addition of the material support weapon to the general counterterrorism arsenal extraterritorially was helping to prosecute things leading up to acts of violence that hadn't been consummated. And particularly when you couldn't prove that the intended victims were American, which is not to say that they weren't likely to be American. We also prosecuted somebody using material support for plotting an attack on a mall in Manchester in the UK. Very likely that if he'd been successful, Americans would have been killed, but you can't prove that at that stage. So that was another instance where material support enabled us um, to, again, hold accountable, but also incapacitate dangerous people. Yeah. Steve, you, you spent uh, your career at headquarters. Can you tell us what the sort of the division of responsibility is customarily in um, terrorism cases in the United States? Well, yeah, to, to summarize it briefly, um, with, you know, with the falling of the wall and the access to uh, the, the information uh, held by the intelligence community, um, 
we had to come up with some way to uh, to actually manage that because of the fact that this is almost a case of be careful what you wish for. If law enforcement and prosecutors now have all this access to in, uh, to uh, intelligence information, it also um, increases the discovery burden. Right. And so the problem was, um, you know, how to actually address that. And so I, I think what really happened early on was that uh, because, you know, the, the counterterrorism section, um, which I guess was known as TDCS then, was, was a prior approval um, a, a prior approval mechanism for any terrorism type prosecution, it also kind of took the lead um, with respect to uh, coordination and liaising with the uh, various intelligence community um, agencies and their general counsel uh, to uh, actually uh, facilitate the review of information that's potentially discoverable, either as Brady, Rule 16 defendant statements or jinx, uh, and to uh, and to actually develop a discovery plan to ensure for the prosecutors in the field that whatever they are anticipating charging uh, will not implicate any type of intelligence information that cannot be safeguarded through a protective order under SEPA. Um, and that's kind of a short answer to that. I could go on, but I think well, maybe we should see where the uh, the rest of the day takes us. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like, um, from what Zainab's saying, is that the material support statute does have an important role. You you also, uh, in when you were not handling extraterritorial cases, you also handled traditional material support cases involving American uh, residents, right? Um, I, yes, I did. Our section did a lot of those. Your section did, yeah. yeah. Okay. And that was informed by intelligence because you were, by the time you came on board, the wall had come down. The wall had been down for about five years. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it, one of the, the, the well-known Operation High Rise, the plot the Al-Qaeda plot that was going to have Najib Alazazi and his co-conspirators bomb the seven train at rush hour in Grand Central mm -hmm. was kicked off by intelligence. And actually, it was British intelligence that Zazi had been communicating with an email address that was known to be associated with Al-Qaeda because of a, that the Brits had learned by the case, by a case they'd done previously, actually they attempted the conspiracy to bomb the mall in Manchester that I'd mentioned. Um, and at the time, US law enforcement learned that. They didn't know anything else about Zazi. Um, and it is really just, you know, both the wall coming down is essential to this. Good luck is essential to this. Um, and in, investigative skill and law enforcement efforts are first and foremost that, they just started surveilling him to try to figure out what was going on at the exact moment that he packed the bomb he had already built by that point in time into the trunk of his car in Colorado and started driving it to New York. And if yeah. that information hadn't come in in that moment and been responded to the way it was, I think his attack would likely have gone on undetected because there was nothing else other than that intel that would be uh, that would have been any reason for law enforcement to focus on him or his co-conspirators before they were able to complete the bombing. Right. Uh, Mike, do you want to say anything about undercover operations and the extent to which we rely on those? Well, I mean, like like anything else in law enforcement, we rely on undercover operations a lot. Um, you know, whether 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 whether, you know, depending on what they're penetrating, I mean, to a certain extent, probably the most um, controversial undercover operations are are generally referred to as stings, where yeah. you have intelligence inform or in, uh, information of some sort, whether it's classified or not, um, that somebody is um, associating with or um, people that are going to to um, plot to do something or are going to travel overseas in order to join ISIS or something. And so you would you 
would attempt to get close to them one way or the other with either a confidential informant or if you could, um, you know, insert an undercover agent. Um, that's what you would do in order to um, learn what their plans were. Right. Um, Sting's, Sting's became fairly controversial because a lot of people thought, well, um, you know, this is just the government um, sticking people in there and, you know, making this stuff up there. The government is just making up terrorists. And um, and so we when when we did training for prosecutors, we we discussed this a lot um, and we we wanted to make sure that um, we weren't we weren't inserting undercover agents and um, and shifting people towards a terrorism event. Mm -hmm. um, we would tell, you know, we would, we would absolutely not, we were not in a statistics game. Um, you know, if you were, we used a Miami case actually as an example. Um, it was known as the Liberty, Civ Liberty City 7 case. Um, these were a bunch of guys that, that uh, pretty much probably would have done anything. They would have run drugs. They would have run guns. They would have, they would have done you know, they were just in it for the money. Um, they actually had no expertise. Um, but what the informant had brought them to us saying, hey, these people um, are happy to work for Al Qaeda. They're, they want to they want to support Al Qaeda. And they were tasked with um, doing surveillance photos of the Miami courthouses and things like that. Um, they also had conversations where they disc where the lead guy discussed his plans to um, kill people as they came out of the John Hancock building mm -hmm. and laid out a map and how he was going to do it. The bottom line though, was these guys had no capability, um, but we charged them with material support, attempted material support to Al Qaeda, um, took three trials. They were ultimately convicted because regardless of their motives, what, what they were going to do was, was provide support to Al Qaeda, but it was a, in a way, it was not a great case, and the biggest problem with it, it was it was totally overhyped. They were they were discussed as a cell, a terrorism cell, and they were anything but. Um, and so, you know, that was the problem with Stings. And the example I use is is Boston. Um, had we had we been aware of what the Boston plotters were going to do um, at the marathon that day. And we had been able to put in an undercover um, and they needed somebody to buy the pressure cooker for them, but all their other plans were moving forward. Well, then we probably would have had, let the undercover buy the pressure cooker and we would have arrested them that morning on their way to the Boston Marathon. Or we, if we waited, we would have waited till he set down what he thought was a bomb, you know, at the location um, along the race and we would have arrested them then. And again, probably that probably then everybody would have said, see, just another sting. This is just <laughs> the government making it up again. So yeah. stings were important. Um, they, they really did head off um, events. But the thing about stings was sometimes they were overhyped and that was very damaging at times. Yeah, I remember a front line, uh, a full front line, uh episode on the liberty seven uh and i think you were you appeared on that as if i'm not mistaken uh with with the very same thing you said today that it was a questionable case when it comes to that but i i um i'm fairly defiant when it comes to um the legitimate need for undercover and sting operations for the reasons that you're describing mike I, I I don't think and it's also alleging entrapment is a very well worn path because entrapment and entrapment is considered an affirmative defense. And we the Department of Justice are batting a, a thousand percent when it comes to claims of entrapment. So uh, you know, you'll you'll find the ACLU and Mike German and others uh, there who will say that all these material support convictions are just uh, are just undercover sting operations, and that's not true at all. Um, yes, Mike, I, can you go ahead? No, I'm I've I've uh, been on the been on okay. the panel with Mike German from time to time. 
Yeah, yeah. He's a friend. Uh, we, we just yeah. happen to, we just agree to disagree, I suppose. But, um, and can you tell us, um, when, when, it, when the time came, when the wall came down, it was it logical that people who are under an intelligence investigation by the FBI would be logical material support defendants? Well, I mean, it, I mean, first of all, I assume everybody on this knows what the wall was, which was, you know, the the, you know, the blockage between intelligence and the intelligence agencies and law enforcement, and the law enforcement agencies. Right. And that there was no sharing back and forth. Um, I mean, when the wall came down, um, you know, I mean, I think I think I think eyes opened to a certain extent on both sides. Um, there were intelligence people that now realized, hey, there may be a criminal option for what we're doing here. And by the same token, you know, prosecutors could now assess um, some of the individuals on the intelligence side of the fence that that they hadn't seen previously. Um, I mean, again, you still would have had this, still had the same issues as to, um, it, you know, can we use the intel or not? Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, it was, again, it was just, you know, bringing that down was bringing together two, you know, somewhat powerful, but previously totally separate entities and uh, making them one so that there was, you know, ideally a, a focused movement forward. Yeah. 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 It, um, it does strike me uh, that the wall coming down and having prosecutorial decisions in terrorism be informed by the best information in the government's possession, including FISA information, if it exists, um, is a uh, it, it can it can result in the discovery of inculpatory information, sometimes in the extreme. But it also uh, for defense oriented people, people who, who defend uh, uh, people for a living on the other side, they it's it's something that they it, it the uh, information from classified sources can be exculpatory it can be brady and so if you're an, an enthusiast if you're an enthusiastic discovery person as a defense attorney you should uh appreciate the fact that we're relying on all source intelligence uh did, go ahead no, I think that was, I mean, that was one of the, one of the things that it did open up for prosecutors, which was a, a whole other um, area of Brady responsibility that they previously didn't have. Yeah. Um, you know, prosecutors, you know, did not, not have access and did not have the ability to look at in, intelligence files beforehand, um, before 9-11 um, and afterwards, not only did could they do it, they now had a responsibility to do it, which sometimes created issues. Right. Yeah. Uh, one of those heavily FISA based cases that I remember uh, from that era when the wall came down was the case of Padilla, um, JUC, and Hassoon in Miami, or in, I guess it was in Miami uh, that Stephanie Pell handled with uh, with Russ Killinger. And that actually went up to the 11th Circuit twice, I think, on the issue of nesting uh, criminal violations within 2339A and how many nestings you can have before it gets too attenuated. Let, let me ask you, um, Zaina, did you, does New York do their own SEPA? Is that an office that, did you, did you make regular trips down to uh, NSA and CIA when you were doing the extraterritorial cases? Yes, I did. Okay. I ton of time, you know, in, in the intelligence agencies reviewing um, the relevant files to look for Brady and other discovery information. And EDNY and SDNY have historically done their own SEPA litigation. And I think, you know, when you have offices that do it and do it frequently, that's, of course, helpful. And when you have a bench that hears it frequently, that's also helpful so that they were, I think those jurisdictions are also 
good ones to conduct SEPA litigation is in because you have an experienced bench, which is, you know, probably harder even to come by than experienced prosecutors um, in this space. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and I know Steve was talking about this earlier, there is a little bit of be careful what you wish for, because most of the time you were just digging through a haystack and for very, very few needles. Um, but we spent a lot of time doing that. And the CIA cafeteria was much better than the NSA one. Yeah, that that was that's all that was always been my experience when doing these, and the SEPA law, the headquarters. That's one thing that the counterterrorism section did do very well. I think is give the give the field a sense of uh, what the current state of the law is on SEPA. Um, but that that being said, I think a lot of Mike, you, you ended up assigning a lot of CTS attorneys to handle SEPA stuff because it was sort of a uniquely D.C. type of practice. Yeah, I mean, again, as I said, it, as as time went on, you know, different different field offices picked up additional, you know, Minneapolis surprisingly turned out to have a lot. And so their their prosecutors became more experienced. But. Um, you know, one of the things very early on, um, again, one of the questions was, well, is CTS going to have grand jury authority themselves, like narcotics and dangerous drugs does, or like economic crimes does? They can go mm -hmm. out, they can go out and, you know, various jurisdictions and start their own grand jury. The decision was made that CTS would not have that authority, that that these cases were so important that they had to be prosecuted by um, the U.S. attorneys in the districts where the events took place or where the terrorists were residing and so forth. So, you know, CTS, you know, again, sort of then was the lead for, um, you know, once once somebody had the prosecution to the extent they needed assistance, that assistance was going to come from CTS. Um, right. And we had the connections with the military. We had the connections with the intelligence agencies. Um, for for the U.S. Attorney's offices that didn't have the ability, we would do, you know, we would put somebody on the case with them. They would have the lead. We would we would do the SEPA for them if that was necessary. Um, and then, as I said, as as the years went on, more offices were able to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, though, the intelligence agency would still want to know from from headquarters, from DOJ headquarters, you know. Um, are we approving this and so forth? But, um, you know, and there were constant, you know, there were 10, 10 courses a year at the South Carolina, at the NAC, um, mm -hmm. you know, training prosecutors and all of this. So, um, you know, CTS had, had a lead, um, but the cases belonged to the U.S. attorneys and, you know, we were there to assist the U.S. attorneys in any way we could. Right. Um, what do you, uh, what I, what do you say, Steve? Is you you were on uh, you got a lot of Shabab cases, and um, my question is how do do is does the FBI material support investigative cadre um, present stuff to us that are based on the current threats? Is that how Shabab came up? Because there was an actual fundraising uh, cell in San Diego that where they were using hawalas to get money back to uh, Somalia. Yeah, but, um, the two cases that I did were outgrowths of what was called Operation Green Arrow. Mm. Uh, that leaves very little to the imagination. It was all about grassroots fundraising among the Somali diaspora uh, uh, for Al-Shabaab. And the facts of the case are unique enough, but it does kind of, uh, it, it kind of points out the commonality of interest between the intelligence community and the law enforcement community in the exact same um, in the exact same target. Um, what I learned in the two different cases that we did, one in 2008 and one in 2013, was that you know our descendants were totally reliant. It was at a time when people could talk on the telephone and nobody was nobody. The bad guys were none the wiser. Mm -hmm. And they were constantly on their phone. And because Shabab's um, fundraising was at the grassroots, 
they were really raising nominal amounts. I mean, I might have had like a tabular indictment in one of those cases where one of the accounts was raising $50. But the, the point was, is that our target had direct access to people who were the face of Al-Shabaab to the West. And of course, you can imagine that the Intel community was, uh, you know, was interested in learning what they had to say. So it, it created, um, let's put it this way, the, the, the first case was in uh, Minneapolis, which was in the process of getting up to speed. And they were already doing some cases of, of uh, individuals who had traveled to, um, to fight for Al-Shabaab. But they were more than happy to have the help, have CTS as a force multiplier, just to get through uh, the intelligence products because we had at least two different agencies within the intelligence community monitoring the communication um, of the uh, of the defendant. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, so those were challenging cases. And I remember the, yeah. I, you know, if, if, if I think back on it, you know, I, I cut my teeth in the tax division doing financial prosecutions. And everybody talks about financial prosecutions as being, oh, they're complex, they're ponderous to investigate. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it, they're just difficult and they're going to be document intensive. And the one thing I learned after I tried to leave that behind and come to the uh, and come to the counterterrorism section and do material support cases is that when you have the, you know a, a joint interest in the intelligence community uh, and the law enforcement and law enforcement between particular targets, uh, the, those uh, cases, the material support cases, are also fairly document intensive. Um, maybe not the same as a financial case, but particularly if it involves communications of the defendant uh, gained from uh, intelligence sources. Hmm. Okay. Um, in uh, in Brooklyn, I assume you had a, a quite a few traveler cases, ISIS cases, Zainab. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Were those? How were those cases? in in terms of their relative difficulty are they are they sort of the easy version of uh of 2339b yeah i think so because at that point in time you know there was one group um who was recruiting and everyone every american kid who was going wanted to go over and join them had you know the specific intent to go over and join um isis in syria and with you know mm -hmm. travel plans to kind of get there reasonably through turkey so it was in that sense sort of fairly straightforward to prosecute you know there it's they were strange cases from a human perspective because like so many of these people were just young idiots who had no yeah. idea what they were in store for when they got there and things like that. So when you actually, you know, were sitting and debriefing the travelers, it felt different from sitting and debriefing someone like Zazi or Venus who had gotten so much right. along um, in their sort of thought process and development of their desire to join these groups and become terrorists. Um, but from an evidentiary perspective, certainly much more straightforward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, we were joking around earlier about how we, uh, in some aggressive cases involving foreign fighters, uh, we would actually uh, charge the person who was driving the defendant to the airport because they were providing material support to a ISIS conspiracy. That was that was something that. Uh, and uh, Steve Ward, you've you well, have been. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Uh, well, I mean, I, I don't want I don't want to make this too light, but it was a little more than that. I mean, yes, we might the but where we took the driver, and there was I think I can remember one case. Okay, uh, he was a full conspirator. Okay, and he was actually the one that was sending the guy that was going overseas. So. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, okay. I, I don't want to leave the impression that, you know, if you drove somebody to the airport, we were prosecuting him for terrorism. Um, Otherwise, Uber, Uber's in trouble, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 
little more to it than that. So yeah, Steve Ward uh, ended up singing a song at uh, a party about the foreign fighter cases. I'm not going to ask you to sing it today, but it was a satire on the, on the traveler cases because we were because the CTS was handling so many of them. You know, Jeff, I think, I think mm -hmm. that by 2014, 2015, um, it was almost like a game of whack-a-mole. Yeah. Mike, I mean, Mike would probably be better able to speak to this, you know, from, from you know, meeting on a recurring basis with the FBI. But from the perspective of a line attorney within the counterterrorism section, it was like, okay, what did this guy do? Yeah. And... Well, I mean, that was that was one of the important things about, um, you know, material support and what what came out of the humanitarian law, Holder versus humanitarian law, um, you know, was, um, you know, the breadth that this that the Supreme Court would allow for um, for 2339B for material support, um, you know, humanitarian law project was about um groups that wanted to help a couple of groups um i think the kurdistan workers party and i think uh tamil tigers. tigers yeah um wanted to help them uh learn how to negotiate better and how to you know um better negotiate with their government but at the same time you know we had we had declared these to be terrorist organizations people could agree or disagree with that but nonetheless they were ftos and the Supreme Court agreed with the government that, in fact, um, you know, for you, even if in theory you're providing you're providing support for what might be viewed as a logically good reason, nonetheless, um, that was support to this terrorist organization. If you were supporting money to a group that, you know, a terrorist organization that maybe had hospitals, and you said, "Well, I only want to give it to them for the hospitals," that freed up money for weapons, and so. Um, so 2339B was was really um, a pretty overarching crime that was uh -huh. able to be used in a lot of different ways. Um, yeah. and, and it was it was a hundred percent prohibitive of dealing with one of the named terrorist organizations. Right. And that was so that was the you know, we used 2339A, of course, but 2339A was more focused on an actual terrorist event. Mm -hmm. um, and so 2339B um, allowed us to get a lot of these people that were, that, that wanted to go travel, that wanted to go do something, that wanted to kill somebody, that wanted to blow something up before they could do it. Right. And that, that became the common, uh, that, that became the common use of 2339B. Uh, although I think talking to Jim Reynolds, who I think wrote 2339B in the designation process, um, I had lunch with him the other day, and he he says that they were they were basically grasping at straws because 2339A was so low volume because the intent requirement was so high, and um, 2339B doesn't have that problem. And if 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 we are I, I don't I don't necessarily suggest that people who work for the State Department wave the American flag uh, as aggressively as I'm about to. But we are we are the envy of the world when it comes to preventing our own nationals from traveling to Turkey and Syria because of our use of 2339B. And our and our heavy prosecution of that. Um, we have we're about halfway done or a little bit more than halfway done. I'm going to uh, I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. We have a couple. We had one from Mike Kraft, uh, which I thought was a good one. Let's see if I can find it. Ah, here's an interesting question from. Uh, from our friend Al Chekavardi. Uh, Probably a fake question, and Al already knows. No, no, this is real. It says, "When when will material support charges be brought against technology platforms who are on notice 
that they are being used to provide material support to terrorism and don't adequately take remedial actions. This is the social media liability for terrorism question. What do you guys think? Well, I'm not in a position since I'm no longer there. So, um, you know, I'm sure these are things that are being looked at regularly by the prosecutors that are in place. But, um, you know, I'm not really in a position to talk about what um, what will be done in yeah yeah in a current yeah. situation like that. Yeah. Okay. I would just note that on notice is not the same thing as intent. It yeah. certainly would be evidence of intent if you know you say you know you knew that this person um, was involved um, in this, but that that itself, I don't think just that knowledge is not necessarily enough to demonstrate an intent to help the yeah. designated terrorist group. And where I think it gets complicated even from a factual perspective, just when you think through the intent question is, there's a difference between, you know, hosting an Anwar al on Twitter, who's all the time saying, go pick up a gun and kill somebody and come join AQAP or the like, not that he was on Twitter, but there, that's one um, extreme. But now that you have designated FTOs, like, um, for example, um, the IRGC Quds Force, that is also a part of government, you have right. a more complicated, so just because it's a commander in that, in the Quds Force, who let's say is not talking, not exhorting anyone to violence or terrorism, but just tweeting about whatever he's tweeting about, it's mm -hmm. a more difficult prudential question as well, um, when you come to what is the intent of the ter of the social media company to to assist a designated terrorist group by hosting the account of somebody who's, you know, in the military, in government, and sort of tweeting about his flower bed, let's say. Right. Yeah, no, that, um, we are probably, the, the program on extremism is probably going to do another event in the near future on social media liability for terrorism. And um, it's, it's, it, it, there, there's a series of moving parts, but one of them is this, uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act provides wide immunity for this new industry that was known as social media or ISPs, and they can't be held liable as if they were a publisher. So they're they're immune from the standard uh, causes of action that newspapers and magazines, hard hard copy, are uh, subject to. Um, and last term in the Supreme Court, there was a question because we have there's another very powerful civil statute that allows people injured by uh, international terrorism to sue those responsible and get treble damages. That's the that's the ATA. And it seems like the Supreme Court right now is trying to come to terms. They're both Ninth Circuit cases. Uh, to kind of come to terms with uh, the issue of uh, liability for social media companies, because plenty of victims, lawyers would love to would love to uh, find the deep pocket either in the banks or in the social media companies. Okay, let's see what other questions we have. Ah, here's a here's one that anticipated what I was going to ask all of you. Do you believe that a similar law could be used for domestic terrorist organizations rather than foreign, or would or will that not work on the way our process is set up? So I don't. You can't. There's there's no way to really designate a domestic group, um, given you know freedom of speech, freedom of association, and so forth. I mean, so. The, the material support 2339B, foreign terrorist organizations, is one thing, but I mean, you can't, it, it does not work um, constitutionally against domestic, um, you know, purely domestic groups, regardless of what their, their hopes and dreams may be. So right. um, now 2339A is another story, I mean, you know, there are things that could probably be done to beef up 2339A to, um, you know, to address domestic violent extremism. Um, you know, you could add, you know, 2339A is dependent upon the enumerated offenses in 2332, 
um, B, I mean, so you could certainly add some of the things you could add, you know, 249 hate crime or, um, you know, 842P, you know, there are a number of statutes you could add to as enumerated crimes um, under at 2332B, yeah. to beef up 2339A for domestic terrorism incidents. But yeah, I would, 2339B I would, will not work. Right. I would think that under 2339A, if they included some civil rights or some hate crime uh, predicates, that would that would perhaps reach the more radical of the domestic terrorist groups. Right. The right wings. Right wings you would, but it would still require, um, you know, a movement towards violence an intention to do something right. as opposed to, again, somebody providing themselves to an FTO as material support. Um, right. You know, 2339A is still more targeted to um, an act of violence, but there are definitely, um, but there are definitely things that could be added as predicate crimes to 2339A that would help, I think, on the domestic front. Yeah, no, I think that's right. We, it would, it would take it away from the definition or the, what do they call it? The federal crime of terrorism is how they describe, for ease of reference, how they describe all those numbers. What other, um, here's a question from an audience member. How do you rate the importance of these material support laws compared with other counterterrorism legislation? Well, I think just the sheer number of 2339B cases yeah. compared to anything else indicates, I mean, honestly, I don't know where we would have gone without 2339B. I mean, it's it was just huge between being able the breadth of the statute in relation to an actual foreign terrorist organization, not just in relation to anybody overseas that's going to do something. Mm -hmm. um, but that 2339B in conjunction with being able to use um, access intelligence information, even if we couldn't use it in the, in the, in the case itself. Um, right. I, I, you can't understate the importance of that statute. Yeah. The one thing that is kind of a, uh, qualification for the efficacy of 2339B is something that Zainab might uh, be familiar with, and that is convictions for 2339B are not coextensive with the terrorism enhancement of the guidelines. In other words, judges don't always give the terrorism enhancement to people convicted of material support. It's a, it's actually more the exception than the rule. In, in Eastern District of New York, you guys had a lot of LTTE procurement cases. Mm -hmm. And these, these I think, were all medical doctors who came over here for a medical conference and decided to buy weapons for their pet cause. And uh, I remember we had a hell of a time getting the judge to give them a terrorism enhancement because he looked at them in the courtroom and they were well-dressed doctors, physicians. And so we ended up not getting the terrorism enhancement in those cases. What's your experience, Steve, with the terrorism enhancement? Um, my parting gift to the uh, counterterrorism section was the Al Hagagi decision, where an individual charged with uh, material support, um, who the FBI was running around with a tear on fire because they couldn't even locate him in the original days in the original days of the uh, uh, investigation. Uh, and they were worried that it was gonna be a, an attack on US soil, but um, it was vigorously uh, litigated. And uh, the, the trial court found that the, uh, that the 2339B, uh, the, the sentencing enhancement applied uh, to his uh, plea of guilty to the conspiracy to commit uh, material support. And uh, when the Ninth Circuit got done with it, Judge Breyer was, was so tired. We really thought that all he would have to do was hold a hearing and make a record that established the facts, you know, from which somebody would, could conclude that al Haggadi's actions were calculated to influence or to retaliate against government conduct. And um, I, I just remember the hearing like it was yesterday. It's like, you know, the Ninth Circuit said, I can't do this. 
Yeah. Which I don't, I don't think is true. And I, you know, I have to admit, I don't know that um, there are several, that there are additional courts that have really cited um, Al Hagagi as, as, you know, as, as very persuasive authority for, you know, for the instance in which you do or do not apply um, the terrorism enhancement to a material support conviction. Mm -hmm. I think that remains to be seen. Yeah, no, I think it's about half and half. I don't, I don't think we can expect to get the terrorism enhancement in every uh, material support conviction. Because, you know, part of it, I think, is that the material support at its inception was considered sort of a white collar crime, which is what drew me to it, because I had that was my experience at the time. Um, but it's been since used in virtually every terrorism case we see uh, that that's been brought. We, we have a 2339B or 2339A. Yeah, and I think that use tends to capture more violent acts or intentions than might have actually been envisioned. Yes. Um, so that it, in, in a sense, it's not it, it's not surprising because there it, there was a smaller universe of the sort of white collar crimes that it was focused on, but a bigger universe of people wanting to assist terrorist groups in accomplishing their violent aims, including by participating. And and that universe is what's captured, I think, largely in the number of prosecutions, but it also therefore, it therefore sort of explains why it might not be entirely coextensive with the terrorism right. enhancement, meaning that you may want to you may want to separate the people with violent intent supporting the violent aims of terrorist group with you know the, the more white collar types of support, although those cases are much fewer. Right, right. Hmm. So um, the one thing, uh, the there was a real moment of uh, nerve when the Supreme Court decided to take this case, the HLP case. Mike, did you have any, um, did you, Alina Kagan, who is now Justice Kagan, argued the case as a solicitor general. Uh, and in, in, it was eventually, uh, as I said, ordered, uh, the, the opinion came out in 2010 and in a majority opinion written by Justice Roberts with a, with a fairly stinging dissent by Justice uh, Breyer. Um, and Mike, did you have any, did you have any discussion with uh, the Solicitor General Elena Kagan before the argument? Um, yeah, yes, I did meet with her. Um, uh, definitely not to discuss the legal arguments, which for this Solicitor General's office is way over my head. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but she did want to, she just wanted to talk. So she brought me up to her office one day. Um, we talked for about an hour. She just wanted to see how we used material support, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, kind of what the cases actually looked like, what the prosecutors in the field were, were actually doing, um. As I say, um, obviously, you know, she had her arguments ready, but she wanted to see what the practical effect was. Mm -hmm. um, so it was it was just a rather informal discussion. Okay. Um, but uh, um, you know, as I say, I, I I later went up for her moot court argument. Um, oh and yeah. Realized that uh, you know, solicitor general's uh, conference room is not a room I belong in. <laughs> uh, they they appear they uh yeah it's like never being a member of a group that would have you as a member it would definitely be a different place if i were there yeah. um, and not not necessarily a better place let's put it that right. way right right <laughs> what do you guys see as the future of material support you, you see that there's been really one uh if there was really only one major legislative reform, and that was in December 2004, uh, where we uh, added clarity to the personnel and the expert advice and assistant types of material support. But what do you think, what do you anticipate as the future of material support, any, any of you? Well, I mean, I think going forward, it, it will continue to be 
important. Um, you know, part of the trick is though, again, for B, it has to be, um, uh, you know, a designated foreign terrorist organization and, you know, getting an organization designated can be kind of tricky. Um, you know, there are multiple offshoots of ISIS, multiple offshoots of, uh, of um, there were multiple offshoots of Al Qaeda. I mean, you know, do you have to, de you know, do we have to go through designations for each offshoot? Does it remain the same group? I mean, those would all be arguments that right. that uh, a defendant can bring later. Um, well, I was going to go join those guys, but you know, I agree with what they're doing, but they're not a terrorist organization. Um, right. So that brings you back to 2339A. And can mm -hmm. you, you know, again, I mean, you know, prosecution is not necessarily meant to be easy. Um, so, you know, you're going to have to show that there was an intent to, um, you know, to promote or to participate in a violent um, attack of some sort. That's what 2339A is. Right. Again, I think, you know, 2339B is not usable domestically. Um, I think 2339A is from time to time. And I I personally think 2339A, again, I'm just repeating myself, but could be beefed up a bit with some additional, um, uh, you know, with some additional, as you said, like hate crimes, um, you know, damage to religious organization, uh, mm -hmm. religious churches, civil disorder. I mean, those could be, those could be added as predicate offenses under 2339A and would give it a little more bite, but. Um... Yeah. Yeah. Zainab, do you have any, what about from an extraterritorial standpoint? Do you, do you feel like the material support is going to stay a pretty prominent tool in that, uh, in that realm? Yes, absolutely. I just, I think it helps um, both the U S uh, bring cases to article three court that would otherwise just not be brought period because right. in so many of the countries where um, terrorist groups have strongholds or self or safe havens, the criminal justice systems themselves are not up to the task of handling these cases. And so, and, but probably also beyond the reach of military intervention to the extent that that could be another um option for mitigating these threats. And so I think it'll remain crucial and sometimes crucial sort of the only option for taking somebody off the grid um, yeah. who's plotting an attack. Right. Yeah, we, um, I, my sense is that we, uh, now never, I'm not going to mention that. I'll, I'll, I'll skip over that, but, uh, But we're not going, you don't, I don't imagine a situation where we would go back to uh, the, the days where we were uh, the world's policemen. I think we've moved beyond that. I'd like to get your impression. After 9-11, I had the distinct impression that we were looking for bodies of defendants and that we were willing to take people uh, into the criminal justice system uh, to 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 basically obviate the need of an allied country to do that work. My sense is that since then, and Zaina, maybe you can confirm this or not, um, is that is that other we we spend a lot of time and a lot of effort providing technical assistance to other countries to help them sort of. Uh, Establish their own tradition of rule of law based terrorism, based counterterrorism. And is that, do you see that staying? I mean, it, when we talk about, um, when we talk about Hamas, we, we really only had, well, we had a couple of Hamas cases in the 2000s, but the big one was one where we had the, we were the sub, it was a subject of a event like this where we talked about the Holy Land Foundation case, which was our singularly most successful uh, terrorist financing case uh, involving Hamas. Um, do you guys see a role for material support in the current, uh, in the current Gaza war, at least for US-based activity? What do you think? 
Well, before you get to that, I'll say first that I think I see the 9-11 timeline differently, but I wasn't there for the, like in doing this work for the initial time period. So I'm interested in how Mike sees it. But to my mind, the history of after 9-11 is less about hunting for criminal defendants and more yeah. about Guantanamo, for example, and, and incapacitating people, but not necessarily um, as a direct um, step towards prosecuting them. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, between, uh, let's, you know, 2000, five, six onwards, it became clear that we could prosecute the types of cases that we didn't think we could because, for example, they uh, involved somebody in country A plot killing, plotting the death of U.S. soldiers in Iraq, which didn't see how are we going to get that guy? You know, if he's in Canada, this is a case we did. We're not going to do a drone strike in Canada. Right. All the evidence right. is in Canada or Iraq. So what do we do? And I think the criminal justice system rose to the task of that and I and still remains a useful um, extraterritorial prosecutions, I should say, still remain a, a fairly useful tool for again holding in, holding accountable and incapacitating people who are going to commit attacks and might well be a good adjunct to the use of the military or even displace some need for military force in that space. So I think that that that's how I sort of see the arc of that. But Mike, you were there. I don't know if you see it differently. No, I think. So, I mean, one of the things that even though the wall came down and we could use Intel, I mean, I think in 2003 to 2006, seven, we were basically, um, for lack of a better term, on a war footing. Um, you know, the what was happening was, you know, a military action to take out enemies. Um, you know, Guantanamo was extraterritorial that wasn't that wasn't wasn't up to prosecutors um in fact there were times where there were actually votes as to whether or not a case should be tried in guantanamo or tried in new york and um uh you know those of us on the prosecution side lost that vote um and so there are people that remain in guantanamo but you know when it became clear that um you know, the Guantanamo thing wasn't going to work. The black sites um, weren't going to work. You know, it moved more from a war footing to a prosecutorial footing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't necessarily agree that we were being the policemen to the world, but we did have issues sometimes with, um, I won't name the government, but there was one government in particular that felt they could not prosecute for certain reasons, um, you know, unique to their laws. And so they, we wanted them to prosecute. They wanted us to prosecute. There were, there were, there were events like that going on back um, in, you know, 2008, 2010, 2012. Um, there were other issues too, where maybe we wanted to prosecute somebody, but uh, we have a death penalty and the European Union, for example, um, opposes the death penalty. And were we going to give assurances or were we not? Um, so some of that was a political question. Right. So, I mean, so while everything has morphed and we're in a different situation, um, you know, to the extent you're asking about Hamas and Gaza, Hamas is one thing, but Gaza is a different thing. Um, yes. So, you know, to the extent that um, we could prosecute Hamas um actors that kidnapped israelis if we ever can come across them if we can if we can figure out who they are i mean there are videos and so forth that's one thing mm -hmm. but i mean you know gaza itself the demonstrations on college campuses and so forth um you know gaza is does not equal hamas in my view uh, there may be people that disagree right. with me but that's yeah no I mean. that's a distinction that i think bears repeating and i appreciate that well, um, we only have a few minutes left, and I'm I'm anticipating some more questions. But let me ask you guys this: uh, Would would you recommend going into terrorism for young lawyers who uh, might be interested? Depends on what their long term interest is. I would say. Um, yeah. I mean, Xanab has come out very well, but you know, I mean, terrorism is a highly specialized area. You know, I mean. And if you want to be a prosecutor for a few years, I mean, terrorism is certainly a fascinating place to be. On the other hand, you know, quite honestly, if uh, your goal one day is to uh, 
make a lot of money, probably you're going to do better in the fraud section um, right. than in the terrorism section, just because it's it's got a broader um, capability in law firms. So, yeah. um, you know, but for, you know, but for, for an interesting um, prosecutorial subject matter and, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's a hard place to be, but it depends right. on your long term. Right. What do you think, Steve? Well, I kind of agree with Mike. I, it, it doesn't really give you a transferable skill um, to go to the private sector so that if your long term ambition is to, you know, be comfortable and make a lot of money, uh, that this is probably not the place to go. On the other yeah. hand, having done it for 35 years, uh, you know, it was the best job I ever had. Um, and uh, there's nothing that beats the feeling of standing up in court and say, saying, Hi, I'm Stephen Ward. I'm from the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C., and I represent the people of the United States. Right. But Zana, you have uh, broken a mold, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I would say if you're just a lawyer starting out and saying, what sh what kind of law should I do? I wouldn't necessarily say terrorism law is kind of where it's at for the reason that, you know, there's not that much work. The cases are hard to make. The law itself is not that complicated, so it's not even that legally challenging. But if you're interested in national security, if you're coming at it from that perspective, I certainly think prosecuting terrorism cases is one of the most meaningful and interesting jobs in national security or, you know, at, or in the law in national security. So I would sort of think of it that way, um, which is to say within the national security space, I think prosecuting terrorism um, offenses is a great, as we've been talking about, sort of merger of worlds of kind of the behind closed doors or behind the curtain intelligence community work and the standing up in court and representing the United States work. You know, I think it's probably one of the most fascinating jobs in national security. So I would think of it from that perspective. But just starting out as a lawyer, I think first you'd have to want to be a prosecutor before you start thinking about should I be prosecuting terrorism cases? And even then I would say, I think, yes, if you're interested in it, but do it with something else. You know, I started when I joined the terrorism unit at EDNY, it was the violent crimes and terrorism unit. And we did gang cases and terrorism cases. And I really learned to try cases and be in court and, you know, get search warrants and suppression hearings and all that stuff through the gang cases, not the terrorism cases. So I don't think I would have developed the full panoply, panoply of litigation skills that I had if I had exclusively done terrorism cases. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think that's right. I, I'm, uh, and what about, what about, um, you, Mike, did, what are the what are the most competitive people who apply to the counterterrorism section, either from outside or from other parts of the department? Well, I mean, at, at different times, you're looking for different things. I mean, so I mean, obviously, somebody with a national security background, um, that was very helpful. But sometimes you wanted somebody that, you know was uh you know a litigator that that just knows how to put cases together because as, yeah. as Zanab said i mean kind of other than you know other than sort of immersing yourself in the intel side of things and getting used to um that aspect of it including stuff you'll see that you'll like that you can't use um you know, there's nothing particularly tricky about it. As we pointed out, 2339A is actually a relative, pretty easy statute. Yeah. It's, you know, it's not like RICO or something. So, um, so, you know, I think anybody that has an interest, it's not, it's not an overwhelmingly difficult field to um, master once you're in it. Um, but you have to have the interest, um, right? you know, and, you know, and it has to be a real interest. I mean, I mean, literally, I mean, at times we'd interview people that wanted to come in and literally they'd say it, what well, sounded like a cool job. And then you'd ask them a question like, well, what do you think of how we treat people at Guantanamo? And they would say, well, I'm not really familiar with Guantanamo. Like, okay, okay sorry. You're probably not going to be the candidate that we're going to pick. So, um, but and that actually happened once. So um so anyway, it's it's a good field, but it's specialized 
And again, it depends on your long term. You want to be a prosecutor for your whole career. It's a good place to be. Um, yeah. But if you want to, you know, move on and do other things, it's a very highly specialized sliver of the law. And yeah. Yeah. What lessons, here's another question from an audience member. What lessons from your tenure do you believe are crucial for current prosecutors to consider in today's evolving threat environment? I'm happy to, I don't, I don't want to keep dominating this. I don't know. If, no, go ahead. I mean, again, I think, again, it's a question of, you know, the lesson that they need, need, to learn is is that you know they're prosecuting for re not you know not to get caught up in the the politics of it to you know to understand you know what they need as evidence um they've also got to understand that you know while they have to get along with the fbi they have to get along to, with whatever law enforcement agency they're working with um they are going to have to understand um the intelligence side of things and, and the fact that there are sometimes competing interests. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so they basically have to be able to, you know, adjust to that type of environment as opposed to, Hey, it's me and the cops and we're going forward. Damn it. Um, right. You know, no, that's right. I mean, that's, um, that is a hard lesson to learn when the political people above us, would say no to a case that we had worked on for a long time for political sensitivities. And that becomes a real challenge. But you guys, I mean, it sounds like you guys are, are uh, bullish on this. I and mean, the people who are tuning in to this broadcast are, I think are people typically interested in this field of prosecution. But um, you, so you would, so Steve, you would do it again. When you say do it, do it again, are you talking about a, a webinar such as this or no, no. position <laughs> at the counterterrorism section? <laughs> the latter. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that, um, uh, you know, it's essentially, you know, I, I, I volunteered to like, you know, fight the war on terrorism from, you know, behind my desk. Right. And at the CIA. Right. And you had military, you had a military intelligence background, as I recall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but it's a, you know, a very little consequence uh, as, right? as far as, as far as, you know, you know, what, uh, what I eventually did. I mean, I wasn't even a lawyer when I was in the military oh, okay. um, and uh, decided it was time to, you know, grow up and, uh, and uh, get a real job. Yeah. Um, my observation, and I don't, I don't know if this is accurate or not, but my observation is there are a lot of alums from the National Security Division who go out and style themselves as national security lawyers, and that might be true in New York as well, uh, Zainab. Uh, but the, uh, I, I was curious. I mean, I follow what they say on LinkedIn and such, but I, I was wondering what is it. What passes for national security law in the private bar right now? Is it export control? Co-chair of Gibson Dunn's national security practice. Ah. Um, <laughs> it's export control, FARA, um, social media companies evaluating their potential liability under mm -hmm. the terrorism statutes. Um, those are, and those are kind of cases that I've handled um, but and I think that some people, you know, particularly people coming out of CES are really able to at least up until a few years ago. I don't know um, how much the influx of FARA cases has slowed. And, by, and I'm talking about civil FARA cases, meaning entities or people wanting to retain legal advice to help them understand right. that they have registration obligations. I don't know if that has continued at the same pace that it did. Um, in the years immediately after the Mueller investigation sort of mm. reinvigorated the statute, but that was certainly a big, um, a big part of private practice of the national security groups in private practice. Yeah, I I talked to David Lofman on occasion, and he's a big spokesman for. He, he's in private practice, or I think he retired recently, and he, he was uh, he was really. Uh, 
singing to anybody who would uh, listen that the FARA statute has become bolstered by the FARA unit in the counter espionage section. And that there's actually, with the Manafort case, there's actually some real teeth to FARA enforcement. And uh, which I always thought was a cool area. I thought it was sort of a, a more technical version of material support. Yeah. And I really think it varies mainly with the enforcement resources and goals that DOJ right. put behind it. It's not so much, you know, the, the, an interpretation of FARA that way it was made in Manafort that changed the ability right. um, to enforce it, but more sort of the matter mm -hmm. of prosecutorial priorities and resources. Right. right. Okay. Well, um, Rosa, we're coming to the end. We have three minutes left. Are there any more questions that you can see? I don't think there are any any more questions. Um, the one we received via email was already on the chat. So yeah, I don't think we have any more questions. But if okay. any, anyone in the audience has more questions, please feel free to send them and we'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll pause for a few seconds. But this was this was fun. I think this was a uh, this was an important topic. And um, this is an all-star panel uh, for those of you who are wondering. This, this, we don't get people of this level of experience very often, even though Mulaney is in black and white. <laughs> so I, I'd, good be, luck. I'd be, I'd be totally covered if I could, but yeah. <laughs> He's conveying his worldview. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. okay, let me check out the questions. Open questions. Okay. Okay. With that, I think we're done. Do you have anything right, else? Well, uh, do you have anything else for uh, Rosa? No, just thank our three panelists and you, Jeff, for this amazing conversation. And, and obviously, our audience, you can stay tuned for all our events. We post them on our website. Also, you can sign up to our newsletter where we also um, send the events, their upcoming events, and also our Twitter account. So, yeah, just thanking everyone for being here. Okay, and thank you for the logistical help. I, we couldn't do that without you. We're at least, the, at least Mike and Steve and I are old. Okay. Well, well thank you for that final note. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just, you can take judicial notice of that. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. So, Okay, right. thanks Bye. you guys. Right, Take care everybody. Okay. Take care everybody.